folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. This is the place where we talk about all things sci-fi and fantasy, but especially steampunk, that wonderful genre that mixes sci-fi, speculation, and history. Today I'm going to talk about a topic that I've been planning to do for some time, but the topic of this particular video is, is steampunk political? Now, when I first encountered steampunk, I, I loved it. I loved the aesthetic. I loved the idea of uh, going back into the past, having this old-fashioned aesthetic, uh, these old-timey inventions with gears and adventure and heroism. It was an era when an individual could make a lot of difference. I mean, when you could invent something that would change the world, and all you had to you know, have was a little spare time and a little bit of money for your equipment. It wasn't like when you had to have a huge lab and uh, then and the government had to give you permission <laughs> to do things like that. It was, it was an amazing leap forward in science and exploration and all those things. So I loved it. Now, I, some of the steampunk stories painted kind of like a bleak past and made it kind of dystopian. Others did not. It didn't really matter to me. I liked it regardless. I mean, if it's a good story, it's a good story, basically. And that was, that was the way I saw it. Now, around the peak of steampunk's popularity was some, somewhere between 2009 to 2011. And at that time, you saw every sci-fi con, there was tons of people dressed up in old Victorian suits and dresses with gears and goggles and uh, fake ray guns and all those things. And myself and Mrs. Direct Desperado did that too. And we'll continue to do that if we ever get the sci-fi con started again <laughs> uh, these days. Uh, but anyway, steampunk suddenly fell out of favor for whatever reason. And at the time, I thought it was kind of like vampires, when we were saturated with vampires after Twilight and all those things, and, and you know, publishers were sick of vampires and even readers got a little sick of vampires, and they would come back soon, but it's been taking a little bit, uh, taking a little while. I mean, it's been like nine years since then. And at the time, we had a, a lot of projects that didn't come to fruition. We had Lantern City, which is a great series of, of graphic novels, which I have wrote about, which was originally supposed to be a TV series. And surprisingly, it hasn't happened yet, despite the fact that they'll have TV series about just about anything. Also, The Night Circus, which was a, a best-selling selling novel, almost a cult novel, by Aaron Mergenstern of this Victorian uh, era of magic and, and clockwork and so on, which I guess is finally going to be made into a movie, if you know, if the world situation allows it, I guess. What happened to steampunk was my question. Why did it suddenly disappear? Was it saturation like the vampires or more or less obsolescence like is what has happened to Western fiction, you know, cowboy stories and movies and so on. And I'm, and you know, I noticed that some of the bigger publishers, I mean, we've still had steampunk novels published, including my own self-published novel. A lot of the bigger publishers like Tor, which is a Macmillan company, and uh, uh, Penguin, which is owned by Random House, they had tons of steampunk titles out in at the height of the boom and very few going forward. Now, lately, you're starting to see them again, um, a little, you know, a little bit more by the majors, but at the time, it looked like it was gone. And so I was kind of suspecting, I love conspiracy theories, <laughs> uh, crazy ones or plausible ones, doesn't matter. And I was thinking it maybe had something to do with what they call the Great Awakening, which is the notion that, you know, during Barack Obama's second term as president, uh, that the, the far left became uh, very culturally ascendant, that the, we, we suddenly started canceling people for saying, for saying unpolite things like 10 years ago. In any case, this kind of a, an atmosphere was sort of anti tradition and anti-history in many ways. So I thought maybe that had something to do with the disappearance of steampunk. And so it's, it's quite possible. I mean, a lot of steampunks had political elements, not and of many different political persuasions. Although I am personally a libertarian, my novel, here's an example, Fidelio's Automata, 
has a very kind of pro-labor, early 20th century anarchist viewpoint to it. And the hero is gay as well, because I wanted to explore that in, in a time when you couldn't come out of the closet, or you could be arrested, and that kind of thing. But in any case, uh, steampunk kind of, kind of uh, fell out of favor, it seemed. So, where was the, what was the origin of steampunk? Steampunk came from cyberpunk. And cyberpunk, as you, if you've you know, ever seen Blade Runner, that's a perfect example, is like this futuristic uh, society where computers do everything in robots and so on. It's usually dystopian, not always, but usually. And, and it involves taking like the idea of cyberspace, going to the extremes like where you can put your brain in a computer, that sort of thing. And with uh, you know, William Gibson's classic Neuromancer, for example. And at the time I hadn't thought of I hadn't thought of a um, cyberpunk being political, but I was reading a blog recently where they where people were disputing whether there was too much politics in sci-fi right now. And the guy said, of course cyberpunk was political. I mean, the whole idea was a rebellion against Reagan and Thatcher, where the corporations take over everything. And you, you do see that theme a lot in cyberpunk. In any case, the whole idea was to take the idea of cyberspace and add an element of punk to it. Now, I always thought that punk meaning they were kind of twisting things, they were kind of changing things, and it didn't have a specific political slant. Although I've seen stuff lately that, that where people thought punk was explicitly uh, left-wing. And so I go back and look at the origins of punk rock, and I've, I've enjoyed, never been a real punk myself, but I've enjoyed a lot of of punk rockers, at least the, the most famous ones like the Sex Pistols and the Clash and the Ramones, for example. And so punk rock, I always thought of as being kind of anarchistic, uh, kind of a rebellion against the 60s. And you saw the punk rockers, they were rejecting the peace love of the, of the 60s, they were rejecting the marijuana and psychedelics in favor of you know, alcohol and cigarettes, <laughs> uh, they were uh, kind of glorified violence, some of them, and they cut their hair off, and, uh, and they were, some of them, very nihilistic and, uh, and anarchistic. And although, you know, certain bands like The Clash was kind of left-wing, uh, you had a lot of left-wing bands, you know, um, basically, Bad Religion is kind of punk. Definitely left wing, but you had the Ramones who had uh, one, you know, uh, Joey, liberal Joey versus conservative Johnny, <laughs> and uh, the, so they had that dichotomy there. And the Sex Pistols, for example, they mocked the British national anthem, "God Save the Queen," but at the same time, they had a, a really brutally anti-abortion song, song, which these days would get you canceled. Definitely would get you canceled from from popular culture. They also had the, the straight edge idea, which rejected drugs and alcohol, which was often very political conservative. And then you had the Oi movement, which was sometimes left wing, but other times it was almost neo Nazi. So I never saw punk as a left wing thing. I always saw it as more of an anarchistic bending thing. So when steampunk came out, I figured it was basically modifying the age of steam, like twisting it, punking it, so to speak. Uh, and although, although I have been recently reading a lot of the steampunk collections from the time, I see that a lot of the writers kind of thought it was a left-wing thing. For example, in, in the 2008 steampunk collection by Anne and Jeff Vandermeer, uh, they argue in their introduction that, that, that um, steampunk is inherently leftist political and that second generation steampunk, which is not political, more like, you know, um, Victorian adventure with gears, <laughs> that is not true steampunk. And that they really lament the loss of this, you know, this anti-capitalism, anti-imperialism type leftish uh, viewpoint. And, and, and that surprised me to see that. <laughs> uh, same thing, similar thing you see and 
Another book, The Mammoth Book of Steampunk, which was edited by Sean Wallace, 2011, uh, the introduction by a woman called Ekaterina Cedia, where she said that steampunk was a criticism to con confront the uneasy past of oppression and uh, uh, dominance of, of the empires and uh, sexism and where women are chattel and other races are exploited. Certainly we had these things in Victorian England, in the Gilded Age America, but at the same time, it was never that cut and dried. It was never all one way. And I never saw it as such. And to me, that was disingenuous to say that oh, the past is all bad and that nothing good came of it. And so maybe this could have had something to do. Maybe too many of us steampunk writers said, we love the past. We love Victorian England. It had a lot of good points. And maybe that was our mistake. <laughs> I did a little research and saw that despite you know, the efforts of some of these steampunk writers to say, no, we're left-wing, we are critical of imperialism, that there were a lot of people writing at the time to say, no, steampunk is evil, steampunk is, is uh, racist. <laughs> you know, um, I know I saw an article by a um, South African writer who said that, um, who was deploring this um, steampunk coffee house that came out, and she was very happy when it went out of business, by the way, and she, she hated the fact that it had a coffee called 1652 Blend, which was the year that Dutch East India came to colonize South Africa. And, uh, I mean, it's a very one-sided view, I thought. And so our good intentions, uh, or at least the good intentions of the Vandermeers, for example, uh, were basically for naught with, with people like uh, Rosa Lister, who wrote the article. So... So my question is, is steampunk, is steampunk political? Is steampunk left-wing? I mean, we know that, in a sense, sci-fi has been political since the 1930s. Uh, there's a interesting YouTube, uh, YouTube creator called QQ, of all things, uh, that argues that the, the, basically the tone of sci-fi was set in the 1930s by the Futurist Society, which is basically a bunch of Fabian socialists including, you know, people like Asimov and Clark and so on, that the, the big guys were that way, including Heinlein, who later became conservative slash libertarian. And it's an interesting, it's an interesting thought. Yet, even though sci-fi had these left-wing progressive roots, you still have people like N.K. Jemisin coming out these days and saying that, that sci-fi is racist as F-bomb. I'm trying to avoid saying the word here. <laughs> and yet they gave Jemison three Hugos. Go figure. Anyway, so you see a lot more, you see a lot of people alleging that steampunk is too white and too, that, that we are exclusionary. And uh, despite the fact that, that people of color do enjoy steampunk and enjoy dressing up in period fashions and so on, in fact, there I found like three blogs that were kind of steampunk from a different, from a non-white view, although they were all very critical of the mainstream uh, European steampunk view, which was, I found disheartening. I welcome these people into our movement, and I've always welcomed them, but for example, uh, Beyond Victoriana by Diana Fa, uh, a multicultural perspective on steampunk, she's kind of condemning imperialism. Although I, imperialism was a mixed bag, seriously, <laughs> if you really study history. Uh, Silver Goggles by Jamie Go, another um, East Asian type person. Uh, she was of Malaysian descent, I believe, where she says uh, it's the Silver Goggles, as opposed to Brass Goggles, which are, are worn by a steampunk post-colonialist who engages with issue of racism and sexism, etc. That's fine, that's fine. Um, I just, as long as you don't shut the rest of us out. Another thing, I, I noticed that you, we've got a lot of African-type steampunk called, um, some call steam funk, and I love that name, I love it. Um, Colson Whitehead wrote a, a novel called Underground Railroad, which I personally thought was, was fantastic. It was involved the history of, of slavery and so on. And uh, in one particular article, the uh, author alleges that um, that those of us who don't address these issues 
like slavery and, and imperialism and so on, that we are liars by omission. <laughs> I, I definitely beg to differ. I, um, I am going to read more of this black steampunk. I, I, definitely there's a guy named um, uh, Maurice Broadus who had a, uh, on his blog, he says, Pimp My Airship, which I think is awesome. So I, I definitely int intend to check out his stuff. But at the same time, I, you know, I have... I've, I definitely have this feeling that I shouldn't have to defend my culture, I shouldn't have to defend my heritage against people who are against detractors. You know, it's, it gets a little discouraging, you know, all this, this uh, rewriting of history. It, it's reminiscent of 1984 where they keep changing history and they change the words you have to use and they change what you can say about history and what was good and who you can celebrate and they take down monuments and so on. It, 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 it reminds me of the famous uh, words, he who cannot remember history is condemned to repeat it. So that's definitely, I definitely believe we need to celebrate the good in our history, to understand the bad, and to um, accept our humanity, accept our imperfections. So I don't like the idea of denigrating steampunk. For example, there was one story in the Vandermeer collection that I just, that I loathed, and in, in this story they took the uh, Victorian fiction idea of the steam man in the prairie, uh, which is like the idea of this um, robot, almost like an early mech story, <laughs> uh, where these guys are exploring the West as part of this, and uh, you know, fighting with Native Americans and so on. So it's it's racist. So they, they basically he took the steam man and he took H.G. Uh, Wells' time machine and in this story um, the time traveler became a vampire and he became evil and um, so extremely evil and irredeemable. It just, the whole story just sickened me. And that's the kind of thing I do not like. I do not like the slander, the destruction of our heroes. and. It was, it was also interesting too. I came across a, a website called Never Was Mag, which is like an online magazine, Never Was Magazine, which is a steampunk about alternate histories. And they ended up with a very bitter dispute way back in 2013 when they did, somebody did um, a book about what they called um, Orientalism. And just the word, using the word Oriental instead of Asian, would produce this firestorm of controversy oh, it was Vic Oriental Vic Oriental Vic Orientalism <laughs> so there was this huge flap between uh, conservatives and, and progressives who thought it was horrific that they used that name and that they shouldn't deal with East Asia if you're not Asian you're, you're culturally appropriating all that nonsense uh, I'd say we're celebrating and imitation is the sincerest form of flattery but that's just me in the end, it, Professor Elemental came out trying to play Peacemaker. Professor Elemental is another one of these steampunk performers, and he actually raps. <laughs> he actually dresses like this uh, uh, English explorer type of, type, of, type of dude, and he, he raps about things like fist fights and so on. He's, he's very cool. And he was basically saying that we should welcome everybody, you know, unless you're an actual racist, uh, which is sometimes hard to define. But, uh, and, you know, I celebrate Professor Elemental's uh, call to peace and call to um, inclusion, but especially, even in Britain, they had Brexit divided a lot of people. Definitely divided a lot of people who said that Brexit was, ra was, was racist and so on. Um, and you can't argue against that because you say that, uh, you say that your motivations aren't, racist and they claim you're lying. So it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate that things became so acrimonious. And I, I definitely call for the steampunk community and all sci-fi communities to embrace tolerance, to embrace diversity not only of background, but diversity of ideology, diversity of opinion. Because only by that, only by doing that can we understand each other. Only by doing that can we make steampunk continue as a wonderful subgenre that in, that includes everybody and that makes people feel like they can enjoy their adventures without guilt.
So, this has been my rather long musing on what is essentially the political nature of steampunk and whether or not the perceived political alignment of steampunk may have had something to do with its fall from grace. Uh, although, I do think it is coming back. I do think steampunk is becoming more popular once again and that we are seeing a few more of those novels published. So, hopefully I'm right about that. So, please let me know what you think about this in the comments below. Please like and subscribe. Uh, we'd like that a lot. And for now, this is the Steampunk Desperado from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.